I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Welcome everyone to this week of Wikipedia. I am Mickey Willardin and today I am bringing to you my conversation that I had with Matthew Carpenter who is a PhD student out of Kingston University. So Matt is a he's sort of completely up to the play with low carbohydrate diets for performance, the use of exogenous ketones and fuel utilization for athletes because that's what he's studying his PhD on and we had a great conversation a few months ago with Brianna Stubbs who was one of the, um, she's very well known in, with her work with exogenous ketones and Matt is building on that sort of previous knowledge and getting that real life experience of low carbohydrate athletes but also athletes who take exogenous ketones so that's what we talk about today so Matt he enrolled at Kingston University in 2014 to complete his BSc in sports science and we talk actually at the start of the interview as to how he got interested in the ketogenic diet and I found his sort of origin story if you like super interesting so he completed a master's in sport and exercise and during his master's degree, he completed a research project around acute carbohydrate supplementation for ultra endurance performance. Um, and we discuss a little bit about that as well. He began his PhD in 2018 to further investigate the role of a ketogenic and low carbohydrate diet intervention on health and exercise performance in addition to addressing the role of acute supplementation in ketogenic athletes and the impact that this does have on substrate metabolism and exercise performance. And Matt and I go into quite a bit of detail as to what that actually looks like, uh, which was super fun to talk about. And you can tell just from the conversation that Matt's super passionate as well. So I will put links to how to find Matt and his research in the show notes as per usual. And... Just before we kick off, I want to remind you that the best way to support the podcast is to leave a five-star review over on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to us because that just gets more awareness of Wikipedia and gets us out there to a wider audience. So thank you so much for all of you who have already done that. We so appreciate it. In addition, uh, sign up to my recipe access on my online portal where for 12 bucks a month, you get access to all of the recipes which are regularly updated. You get a Facebook members only group. We get members only Facebook lives. You get a weekly email from me and the opportunity to pick my brain on anything nutrition related. So that's a really great way to support the podcast as well. All right, team. Please enjoy this conversation that I had with Matt Carpenter. Now I'm like, yeah, okay. I understand. <laughs> I know what that's about. <laughs> hey, um, Matt, um, thank you so much to, for taking the time uh, this morning, your afternoon, to come and chat to me. Um, I was super excited to listen to your podcast on Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach because I really felt you are um, one of the people that are going to be able to bridge that gap between science and practice with your research. So that must be a pretty exciting space to be. First of all, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into low carbohydrate um, research? And um, and I think that's a, like a good place to sort of start. Yeah, sure. First, yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, I really like talking about this stuff and it is actually, it's a really exciting space and I find like I started my research in this five or six years ago. And at that point, when I first started looking into it, I thought, this is really exciting. You know, there's a lot going to happen. And I'm kind of in that exact same space now where a lot has been happening and it's still kind of just as exciting, which is nice. Um, but yeah, with my sort of journey into researching this all started off from, so I'm, my background's in sports science. And so I did my undergraduate here at Kingston in sports science and kind of get, got to the end of my second year of my undergrad and you get to the point where you've, you've got to plan your dissertation and I was in the exact same position as everyone else of, you know, 
I need to think of something that I want to do. And I had, I had no idea. I was looking at all these sorts of things. We do a lot of work with supplements and they're quite nice to do for dissertations because it's fairly straightforward. And you give someone, we do some work with things like dark chocolates and bits like that. And so I was looking at that thinking, oh, that might be a nice thing to do. And then I saw um, one of my supervisor's interests being low carb, high fat diets. And diet hadn't been anything that I'd looked into loads, but it's always kind of like a lingering interest I had. Originally, it was what I wanted to study, actually. I'd, so we have sort of a few sort of courses within sports science sort of similar ones. So we have an exercise nutrition health course here, which is one I was originally supposed to do. So I kind of always had like an interest in nutrition, but hadn't really acted upon it. And I saw that and I was like, no, that looks like fun. I kind of want to do that. Um, and so it, w- it was a little more than that. They kind of got me into it. But then I kind of, <laughs> if I had known then where I'd sort of be now, I, I, I don't think I'd believe it because I remember it all kind of started with my first meeting with my supervisor who it's the first time he had ever Start, he wanted to look into it from a research perspective and it was because he had experienced it himself and none of us knew that at the time and it was kind of it was a weird moment still because I remember seeing him between our first and second year of uni he came back and gave like our inaugural lecture of the year in our second year and we, we were all sitting there like waiting on a lecture and we sort of looked at him come in and thought it was almost like a double take we were like oh it is it is the same person because <laughs> he and he wasn't in bad shape before or anything but he came back and looked completely sort of trimmed down and and was like his face like you could see like the cheekbones and everything he looked amazing <laughs> and so we're like wow so was he was he an exercise scientist or was he in your sort of nutrition person for your exercise no, he, he's a, he's a sport, sport scientist as well so his background isn't nutrition okay yeah um, but well, so he, his his work actually his work was in it's kind of a mixture of nutrition and sports science actually his his work was in carbohydrate supplementation interestingly, um, yeah yeah o- over summer he um he he had started so he'd been really into low carb high fat diets and stuff and sort of been progressively gaining just a little bit of weight and as he got older and suddenly it was just all gone the next time we saw him and n- <laughs> no one kind of knew what he had done until then I went in for this sort of first meeting with him and. I remember, the, I remember the, my first meeting, I was, I was shaking because I'm sort of a, an undergraduate second year and he's a head of sports science and he's sort of this scary guy. And I sort of just sat down and, and received like a 45 minute lecture from him on just everything that he was like, everything he had done. And just, it was almost, it was a lot to take in at the time, but, um, but that's really where it started. And, and the idea was to look into the role of low carbohydrate diets, particularly in ultra endurance was where we started. And so we started with a couple of case studies just in, um, ultra endurance exercise and how firstly how keto diets impacted the metabolism of, of a runner and also performance with this ultra endurance kind of um, event and then we pushed on into looking at supplementation because once we sort of started looking into low carb diets around exercise you see that there's not actually there's still even to this day there's not that much literature on it but the research there is on it you have some really nice like fairly well controlled studies and I looked at that especially as a as an undergraduate student I remember the first time I went to with my idea of what to study I was like okay I want to get 12 participants and I want to get I want to get them keto for eight weeks and he was like you're not gonna you're not gonna get that done in a year <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, like, we're gonna start with a case study etc um once I did that we kind of looked at, at the research and we're like okay I'm not sure how much we can add just by doing another intervention and more are needed but it's like if we wanted to do one we'd have to do it have to be a, a long one we'd have to do it would be take a lot to do so we're like, we kind of wanted to take a slightly different look into it and look at it from the perspective of like fueling acutely because we think it's, firstly, it was a really interesting way to go. And secondly, it hadn't been done before. And so we moved yeah. from just like keto diets into actually fueling and how like acute fueling impacts the metabolism of people that are, say, fat adapted. Um, so that's kind of how when it all started. It kind of started with the long ultra endurance stuff has kind of come down now more to standard sort of endurance, but much more standard um, like high intensity aerobic endurance type stuff. Um, and that's still where we are. And the kind of the more I did it, the more I got interested in just fat adapted individuals as a cohort of people almost, because yeah, I guess the more you read and the more you, you listen, especially when you, there's a lot of people doing it, it's almost like a ground up movement to a point. So I, was like, I kind of want to understand this more. And sometimes and you see this with supplements as well, where a supplement gets a lot of hype and then you get people buy into it before the research gets done and then the research gets done slowly and then you kind of realize okay this does work or this doesn't work etc i kind of see the same almost with Mm. keto where you get the big hype loads of people are doing it now and the research is kind of starting to say catch up it's starting to show us what's actually going on and so kind of from that i was like whilst we're getting all this research done, i kind of want to i feel like there's a a space for research where we actually just qualitatively look into the experience of these people because there's so many now um that's kind of where it's moved Yes, it's really interesting when I um, look at 
so you, you're right. There is like a small body of um, sort of literature, but it, and it is growing. And there is you know, there are these group there is there are these groups of studies. Or sorry, gr- groups of studies. And I'm thinking about race walkers, mm. for example. Um, and they're a cohort, and that's been used by a research group, and a lot of things have been tested. But particularly in some of those early studies, some of the ways that they were um, administering like um, fat as a supplement during a high intensity sort of race scenario. Mm. I just thought that's not really what I would do as a practitioner if I'm dealing with someone who wants to be low carb and wants to be keto. Like, so what are some of the, are there anything, any themes on the research that you're hoping that your research will sort of either back up or, or you're really interested in exploring more on that qualitative level? Right? Yeah, completely. I think that's a really big one that you just highlighted because when I look to the research, you see exactly that, that. And I see it as a potential big confounder in that you can have a group of people on keto diet, a group, a control group. And I'm, and you see the same thing when, <laughs> funnily, when we did our case studies where we we're looking at like in race fueling for our ultra endurance marathon run that we had, we had going, when we tried to keep them fat throughout his race, it didn't end well. <laughs> it, mm, yeah, we don't need to go into too much detail. It didn't end well. Like it, it, it's it's tough to keep it down. And um, and so realistically, then I, I looked at that, especially with the. I mean, there's so much research in sports science and nutrition about the role of carbohydrate, just as a essentially essentially as an ergogenic aid. And so when I look at mm. some of the research done that has, especially now, there's in sports science, we've got more sort of a uh, movement towards giving people pre-race meals to try and mimic actual um, like race days rather than them being fasted. And so in the ketogenic diet studies, we see a control group having you know a carbohydrate-based breakfast and a keto group having a keto breakfast. And so one of the things that I've been trying to explore is, well, could that be a confounding variable if it is that going to impair their performance? And actually, what would happen if you give the keto people the same, if we match that pre-race meal? And so I think mm. what I kind of want to see and what I'm what I see when I speak to people on keto diets is that very few people are as afraid of carbohydrates. I think I thought going into it, so I, I think I had a preconception as well as I think a lot of people do in sports science that if someone's keto, they they avoid carbohydrate at all costs and they sort of, they, mm. they, they look at a banana and they kind of like shriek and try and, and jump away from it. <laughs> when actually it, in reality, in speaking to quite a few people, obviously you, you get people that do all sorts of, of things. And some people I know, you know, people run 100 miles without taking any carbohydrate on board and, and things like that. But the majority of people, especially when, when they're doing like high-end aerobic activity, they're taking carbohydrate around performance in differing ways and to differing degrees. But there's definitely a theme of people being a lot less sort of wary of carbohydrate and an acknowledgement really that there's a time and a place for it. I think that has really important research implications for these exact interventions because a lot of them at the moment, even ones, because I think the, most of the intervention research in keto diets is almost... It's interesting in how uninteresting it is to a point where a lot of it's fairly equivocal. Um, yeah. But that's with the fact that s- some keto groups aren't, well, I, I've not seen many much research in, in carbohydrate re-implementation. So I think that's sort of this kind of qualitative aspect. And I come from a completely quantitative background, right? So starting a qualitative stuff, was, it was kind of a big learning experience for me. But, but the more I do it, the more I think this actually could have big implications for research moving forwards because actually... Whilst we have a lot of really interesting intervention data, none of it matches pre-race meals. But in reality, actually, especially on like the ultra ultra running or ultra endurance scene, I think almost everyone's taking in carbohydrate as they go, and maybe not so much as a carbohydrate adapted athlete. But even even that, I'm kind of becoming less and less sure about because a lot of people don't take in as much carbohydrate as they're told to when they're on standard diets. So even though people on keto diets tend to eat less and, and will need less carbohydrate because they've trained their fat metabolism, because of the lack of how much some, a lot of people struggle to get carbohydrate in, even when they're carbohydrate adapted, I, I'm not sure there's necessarily too much of a difference when you compare the two. It's just potentially that a group of fat adapted athletes or people don't have to be necessarily athletes, depending on how you define it. But they maybe just reduce their need for carbohydrate, but you can still consume just as much unless, you know, you get the freaks that can consume loads of carbohydrate and they're fine, but I don't think they're in the, in the majority. I think they maybe on average will take in slightly more, but I think there's a lot more overlap in that a lot of people I speak to, you hear the sort of 35, 45, 50 grams of carbohydrate, some of them, which isn't that dissimilar to what a lot of people take during ultra runs when they're on standard diets, because taking more, especially as it gets longer, gets kind of hard on the stomach. So, um, yeah, there's, I think the general, the, I think the most, Point thing I found was that there are 
there's a lot less dogmatism in the sort of low carb athletes than I I think most people in sports science would kind of see when you when you're out of it and you're just seeing the sort of loud voices in the kind of movement as such it makes it gives it that kind of dogmatic feel where it's you kind of you're almost a bit scared of carbohydrate but speaking to people that are doing it I, I didn't get that sense at all yeah it's so interesting isn't it and I I'm really curious to hear sort of what you sort of thought a keto diet was sort of going in and chatting to these people and what actually a keto diet might be in practice. So what are you finding in, in that space? And I, I guess I'll just back that up by because people who, who are, who've heard of the keto diet or maybe seen it on social media have quite, think it's quite sort of a uh, strict kind of under 20 grams of carbohydrate mm. and it's very difficult to sort of adhere to and stuff. So what are you sort of finding, Matt? Yeah, it's a tough one because I think this is where the I, I struggle with the term keto itself and I'm, I'm definitely part of a problem where we I'll use the term keto diet because we have to kind of define something, but actually it, it, it doesn't mean one thing at all. And, it, and even just within like runners, it's di- different people. There's no one way of doing anything. Um, so it's really difficult to define because you can find, you know, any way to define it really, can't you? But within specifically endurance, what I found is that very few people, people don't track as much as I would expect. I think, especially once you get into it, because you kind of get to understand like how much carbohydrate you feel good on when you're running. And when someone's running or exercising, they're not necessarily wanting to be in ketosis all the time. That's not necessarily the goal. The goal is to burn good amounts of fat, train your fat metabolism, etc. And you don't have to have super high ketones or, I mean, really you don't need to, to particularly be in ketosis to be burning a huge amount of fat. It really depends. And so when it comes to like values of carbohydrate, it's hard to define just simply because people aren't tracking. But what is clear is that there's, <laughs> there are levels. Uh, there, are, there are the very strict sort of key, low carb keto people that are really avoiding, you know, certain vegetables and bits like that. But I think at least with the people I've spoken to, there's very little of that. It's much more. I think there's an acceptance for active individuals that you can, you, you don't have to, for example, if I use things like onions as an example of something that I've, I know people, I've spoken to people that have done keto before for weight loss and they've been told to avoid onions and avoid things like this. And I think there's definitely at least in the in, endurance kind of community and acknowledgement that you don't need to be that strict. Like there's, there's not really mm-hmm. any, any point of it, which is, it's it's tricky because yeah keto could mean anything and a lot of people would probably if you take a really strict definition of keto as under 50 grams of carbohydrate under 30 i mean you can literally you can pick any number between zero and 50 and say carbs or net carbs and it's been defined as keto somewhere then a lot of these people wouldn't be defined as keto but you test their ketones and they'll be in ketosis 95 percent of the time so it's kind of an issue i think there with the definition but there's definitely a level of you know there's definitely more carbohydrate consumption going on in people that are running ultra endurance or or any kind of endurance exercise really and it's it makes complete sense <laughs> because no matter how fat yeah. up to joy you're always going to burn carbohydrate so there's definitely yeah a level of you know periodizing carbohydrate to a point around hard exercise but it's still i mean it's it's the kind of typical thing of avoiding sugars avoiding starches and outside of that it's it's kind of much more periodized um, which may be different mm. in other settings. So you obviously have then keto diets, that medical-based ketogenic diets, or people that are doing it for other things. Um, I think there, the, there's there's definitely a, a problem in the definition, or just the use of the word keto itself, which can mean just so many different things. Matt, there, recently there was a paper that came out that looked at the ways with which we can sort of train low glycogen to help with um, fat adaptation, and you know the four sort of the train low, um, sleep low, double training days, mm. and um, and then sort of delaying feeding after that sort of initial exercise bout is a way to increase our um, adaptation to um, sort of endurance. Um, and a paper had come out to say that really there's no good performance enhancement that has been found in the literature with these strategies. Did you see the paper? Do you have any thoughts on that and how that sort of applies in real life as to how useful these tactics are? Because a lot of us as practitioners, this is these are the things that we use and, and um, we hear that this is actually a good way to assess that sort of fat if someone is fat adapted. Mm. Yeah, it's it's one I'm still, I'm slightly torn on. So I, I'm not sure about the paper you're referring to, but I have come across, um, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time looking at the sort of train low literature because of how well it applies to keto diets because someone on a keto diet is training low pretty much all the time, right? A lot of the time. Um, 
And I think it's one of those interesting areas, fasted training or any way of training with low glycogen availability, where you have a lot of mechanism, but what it's lacking right now is, is clear performance improvements. I think there's definitely mm. a point here that I, I wonder about, which is an adaptation phase to training on low glycogen. What I mean by that is that whilst you're not very good at burning fat, that's always going to be harder training. And then you have within the literature in low glycogen availability training, you have different ways of basically different methodologies in which um, whether you match intensity or not. And a big problem for a lot of people is that if, if they're training with low glycogen, their intensity is lower and, and the exercise is harder. And there's good reason for that if, if someone, for example, is, is not a great fat burner. And also, mm. just if you're not used to doing something, it, it takes, just like adapting to keto takes some time, adapting to training with low glycogen availability, is, it's not too dissimilar in a sense. And so my suspicion is that if someone's trying to improve their performance by training on low glycogen, but they can't maintain the same performance output, that same power output, et cetera, then it makes complete sense they're not going to get better. If you're able to match mm. intensity and keep the glycogen low, which is theoretically what you can do once you're fat adapted, you're able to still perform that same session on low glycogen availability, then I would mm. be more inclined to think, well, if nothing else, you're not losing anything by doing the same thing and potentially getting the benefits. So it's an interesting yeah. yeah I, it's one that, to be honest, I'm I'm kind of torn on for as like a standard tool for a non keto adapted athlete. And I think it's because also then <laughs> this is where I kind of get myself going around in circles. Because then if someone says to me, "Oh, I just I find it really hard to train faster," for example, then I'm going to say, "Do it," because to me that's a sign of you, you're really not good at burning fat, and this is going to help you, right? So like yeah, kind of yeah. almost a completely unscientific test I would do for someone to see if how how well they burn fat is say when you wake up get up and go for a run or go for a cycle and see how you feel compared to you know sitting down having your your, your morning porridge or whatever um so I, yeah i am kind of torn because <laughs> i see i see a lot of mechanism and so my theory within like a fat adapted community is okay make the most of that because you can train just as well um yeah. whereas if you can't match the intensity then it makes sense that you may not necessarily get the same the same performance benefits yeah, no, that's that's a really good analysis. And um, I'm so glad I'm talking to you because I love picking the brains of sort of people in the field about some of the studies I see. Um, and there are also, you know, there are studies that suggest that after four days, the body can, um, the enzymes that are responsible for fat adaptation have been switched on. And actually, so you, when you look out there with research studies that are very short term to then test the effects of a ketogenic or a low carb approach, mm. um, people say, well, you know, you've had enough time, but people talk about the sort of the length that it takes for fat adaptation. So are there, you know, what do we know about the length of time it might take to become truly fat adapted and what's missing potentially from some of that research out there? Yeah, I, this is keto adaptation and fat adaptation. I think they're, my, they're kind of like my least favorite and also favorite areas because there's so little we know. But it's one of those where mm. I, think we tr I think we have, especially within sports science, you, you put a lot of value in what you can measure. And so we can measure things like in the lab, we can really easily measure fat oxidation, right? We can measure ketones with the prick of a finger. These things are really easy. And so we put a huge mm. amount of value in them. Whereas when you look at the, li the literature within performance, you see like very clear detriments in performance after a week. However, you see, I mean, fat oxidation can be as high as it ever goes after a week of, of low carbohydrate or ketogenic dieting, which is, is paradoxical if you're saying that fat oxidation is your marker of keto or, or fat adaptation say and yet someone's t someone can't can barely exercise i mean <laughs> i've spoken to people that have said they can barely get out and walk the dog for the first week or so when they <laughs> drop their carbohydrate now their fat oxidation is going to be really high but their performance isn't, isn't going to be very good if they if they can barely do <laughs> these are like ultra ultra endurance athletes that can barely leave the house and do like a 5k say and so i think with fat adaptation or keto adaptation we know far less than um, well, at least far less than I thought before I went into the research. You kind of, especially with people, we like certainty, I guess. And so whether it's someone saying that it takes two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, three months, I, I mean, we don't know. Um, and I think the problem we have is we're very obsessed with looking for what, what can we measure that tells us that someone's adapted. I don't think there's ever going to be a marker of keto adaptation that tells us yes or no. 
Um, and there are a lot of things yeah. you can look out for. And I mean, so fat adaptation and fat oxidation increasing is obviously a prerequisite for fat adaptation, but it's certainly not the only thing to look for because, like I say, when fat oxidation goes high, it doesn't mean someone can actually perform. And I think the biggest thing right now we're missing in the absence of of more markers that we can we can search for is just this is what I'm trying to do interviewing fat adapted athletes is actually just talk to the talk about their experience to them and ask them what they feel and how they felt. And that's not necessarily to give mm. a number because I don't think a weeks or a months or a number is ever going to, there's never going to be like, a, it takes this amount of time because I've also spoken mm. to people that never felt anything and felt fine straight away and just sort of carried on. And we're yeah. just, you know, three days, four days, two weeks, they never felt a difference. Whereas I've got other people that will say it, you know, it took me three months and it, and it may well have, but it's never going to be the same for multiple people. So I think what's missing is, I feel like I'm I'm uh, going against my quantitative roots, but it, it's actually just it, asking someone, asking an athlete their experience and how they feel. So I think to put that into like a research perspective, if I was to conduct a, a, an intervention study, I would combine quantitative markers such as fat oxidation, such as you know your ketone bodies, with things like mood state questionnaires and even mm. simple like journaling to see like how is someone feeling after a run. Like a an RPE scale would work fairly well. Um, just to to add that into it, because I don't think we have the markers to be able to know if someone's adapted by you know by taking a blood sample for it. For example, we might one day be able to get like a picture, but it's never going to tell us the full story beyond like an athlete. You like <laughs> I still remember because the case study I was doing, we I I had my ultra marathon athlete in the lab after a week, and his fat oxidation, like I say, was it was really really high, but his mm. his performance. I wouldn't have made him do an ultra. That that would have been cruel to make him run ultra marathon after a week. Right? <laughs> and, and no, no one really would tell someone to make a big dietary shift. Say you know two, three, four weeks before a big race. So we don't know. <laughs> and and I, don't, yeah. I don't think yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's ever going to be a number. I, th- I think it's going to take kind of a more hybrid approach between quantitative and qualitative measures. And I'm sure in time, um, yeah, because and this is where I see the idea of keto is still in such early days of research within performance and even though it feels like it's been around forever to me at least but then you look through the literature and and there's a lot but there's a lot we don't know still which is why i think i think it's a question that's never going to be answered (laughs) but i think we'll get a better picture yeah it's interesting because i see like on a lot of in a lot of the groups that i um am in you know with athletes that are really interested in trying the low carb area like a lot of people feel quite um distraught that they're measuring their ketones and they're not getting above 0.4 mm. or that um yeah in this this whole idea of you know I'm under 50 grams of carbs a day I'm following this particular formula that someone's put together as to how to become fat adapted but I'm not fat adapted and there's that um misconception that your uh, blood ketones are the measure mm. of sort of being fat adapted so what do blood ketones actually tell us matt well they tell you there are ketones in your blood i think i i struggle to it's another one of those where i'm kind of the more i look into it the less value i put in it past the the early stages i think it's a great marker when you start out of you know oh okay i'm i am doing the right thing especially for for someone that's starting keto without you know like someone supervising them through it it can be quite like a quite a drastic change it's quite like a tough thing to do so it's you have it in that sense as it's reassurance that your body is creating ketones and and we know that so long as you're not taking like exogenous ketones on top you, you know that that's coming from your fat metabolism so that's that's a good sign there i i wouldn't put too much value in in how blood ketones can predict actual ketone oxidation um so beyond just knowing that you have ketones circulating in your system, I wouldn't put huge amounts of value in it beyond that right now. But it does. But it, does, it, tell, it tells you. It tells you that you're in ketosis. And I. Yeah. I just. I'm not. I like it as a measure, but I, I wouldn't want to put too much weight in it. Again, as looking from a, like an adaptation perspective, because someone can be in ketosis after three or four days, and their ketones, and they might their ketones may well be lower after a few weeks than they were when they started without doing anything different and to me that's probably more a good thing than it's a bad thing it probably suggests that there's just a greater rate of ketone uptake in the muscle um whereas that could easily be taken as oh no what am i doing wrong i need to increase my fats i need to drop my carbs further which especially for someone in endurance i mean that's probably not the answer if you're already at yeah say 40 grams a day or whatever and you i wouldn't i think there's still maybe less so i think at one point, I, I definitely sensed there was like a chasing ketones mentality to a point. I'm not sure there is so much now, actually, interestingly. I think 
I think there is less of that. I think there's more acknowledgement that, at least in the endurance space, that ketones aren't necessarily the goal. They're kind of a, a byproduct, really, of, of the fat metabolism. Yeah. And I wonder whether it's where you look as well, because I agree with you, like in the sort of um, in the space of uh, looking at ketones, if you are um, what maybe if you've been in it in a while, you sort of understand and appreciate that. But all of the people sort of coming in and trying it for the first time, I feel like they're still in that sort of, oh, no, you know, my ketone. I'm obviously not in ketosis because it's not hit past this arbitrary number of sort of mm. 0.5 millimoles per litre. Um, Matt, what you mentioned before, which would be great for you to just explain to people if, if it's all right. Like you said, you don't have to be in ketosis um, to be burning large amounts of fat. And I feel like people do get a little bit confused in that space. Are you able just to sort of explain what you mean? Yeah, of course. And so I think the way I would describe it is that if you're in ketosis and exercising, you know you are burning a lot of fat, but you don't have to be in ketosis to do it. And having higher ketones won't necessarily mean you're, you're burning more fat. And so what ketones are fundamentally is that you have a, a spillover of, of excess fat accumulation that becomes ketones. So you know that if there are ketones in your body, you are burning fat. But you, you can be, you can, I mean, we, you see athletes, we have, you can see athletes that follow, you know, Western diets that you would probably describe, especially actually in the ultra endurance space where they're training on low glycogen so often their their fat adaptation is not to the extent of someone keto but it, it they're burning huge amounts of fat probably what i would describe as fat adapted without ever being keto mm. and often ketosis will be a byproduct of burning a lot of fat simply because of that accumulation of, of fat obsession spilling over but they are two distinct things and you can burn a lot of fat whilst for example i mean a good example would be doing some kind of ultra endurance exercise and taking carbohydrate on board throughout, say, a run or a cycle. And you can still burn huge amounts of fat and avoid being in ketosis because you're taking in that carbohydrate. So I guess it's kind of like being in ketosis is a marker of fat oxidation, but it isn't a prerequisite for it um, mm. because you can, you can burn a lot of fat without necessarily being in ketosis. You can burn a lot of fat whilst having fairly decent glycogen stores still and avoid ketosis. It gets a bit different, I suppose, in the like, ultra marathon like... I remember, I think my favorite publication of the last two years, I, I talk about, I think every time I talk to anyone about ketosis, was um, it was like a five-day ultramarathon run with, um, it was a fairly small sample size, but they tracked them, tracked their ketones at the end of every day. And these people were like pounding carbohydrate as you would as like a, you know, doing an ultra endurance run over five days or whatever. And they're in ketosis like, at the end of, at least I think it was day three, four and five, they were, everyone was in ketosis, consuming nine grams per kilogram body weight of carbohydrate a day. And it kind of shows that, <laughs> Like it's kind of hard to avoid ketosis in that sense, um, yeah. <laughs> but they'll be burning a lot of fat as well. And it, so sometimes ketosis is kind of unavoidable if you are burning through a lot of fat and, and carbohydrate. But but it's completely possible mm. to burn fat yeah without that excess ketone production as well. Yeah, Matt, are you also looking at um, ketone supplementation and sort of who uses it, how it's used, and and all of that? Yeah. So originally, so when I. When I started my PhD, we were planning on just focusing on keto diets, um, and then, well, then uh, we sort of we had one study going on that we sort of cancelled because of our sort of lab lockdown and things like that, and it just became too much of a. It was it was actually a keto intervention study, and we were like, okay, this is just it's not practical anymore, and so I had I had some time to look into uh, what where in the same space can we look into that might be valuable, and I guess the way I looked at it was that from the research I'm doing where I'm looking I'm I'm trying to bring in fat adapted or keto adapted individuals. I was like, well, what else can we do with them that will be interesting? And this, that's where ketone supplementation for me came in because there's this, I mean, rapidly growing area of research within uh, ketone esters and ketone supplements in general. And, and all of it understandably is done on people on standard diets because, you know, why wouldn't you obviously? Um, but then for us, I thought, I mean, we, our lab, you know, we haven't got millions of pounds to spend, but what we do have is a nice cohort of fat-adapted athletes. Mm. And just as research is growing, you see things, especially, I think the most interesting recent paper I came across, I forget who the authors were, I think they're out of Oxford University, they're doing a lot of work with ketone esters, where they showed how little contribution ketones made to exercise performance in a lot of, in, in these standard athletes, which is really interesting for me because obviously you've got all this research going on with ketone esters and whether they improve performance, but this paper showed, I think they contributed approximately 4% of total energy, which is really, mm. really low. Um, 
And then on top of that, and, and the reason being that, especially at fairly high intensities with athletes that have got make, topped up glycogen stores, is that carbohydrate is used in preference to the ketones. Mm-hmm. But then just come across and I, all my work is in humans and I'm, I'm, I, I struggle with, with like rodent studies. I, I have to read them about three times before that I can make any sense of them. But, but there's rodent studies looking at sort of the impact of low-grade ketosis, chronic low-grade ketosis and how that impacts the response to exogenous ketones. And it suggested that actually mm. this chronic exposure, at least in rodents, to low-grade ketosis um, meant that these rodents could use um, ketone or exogenous ketones to a much greater extent and basically override this mm. so in the standard rodents having sufficient pyruvate from carbohydrate uh, essentially inhibited the use of ketones but having then this chronic exposure okay. to low-grade ketones overrode that so they could still use the ketones even even if they had sufficient pyruvate stores so i looked at that and thought okay we're going to try keto- ketone supplements on fat adapted athletes and see if they respond differently um, and so, yeah, that, that's what we're looking at as well. So that's because um, with that chronic sort of low-grade ketosis, their body is adapted to that low-carb environment and that fat oxidation. So their body might know how to use the ketones supplements more than someone who is um, sort of a higher-carb athlete. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, completely. I think the possibly oversimplistic way to look at it, the way I see it at the moment, is it's just just as when you go on a low-carbohydrate diet, you downregulate your uh, PDH and you become worse at using carbohydrate, you could I look at it mm. the exact opposite way, essentially for something like a ketone supplement, where as soon as you, you expose yourself to ketones, you upregulate your MCT enzymes and enzymes that use ketones. And so it makes complete sense that then you're more able to oxidize them if you take them in. Yeah, it's so interesting. So, because I know that um, a lot of the research is done in esters, whereas mm. sort of at the um, public level, the most uh, available and cheaper version would be the ketone mm. salts. Um, have you used them, Matt? Do you have, do you have athletes that use the ketone salts? I, I know I, I know a few that use ketone salts. Um, I've tried them. Mm. I, what, what I find interesting about the salts, specifically for people that are on low carb or keto diets, is that you hear so much and think back to the you know the thousands of talks that like the Stephen Finney have given on YouTube, and he talks about salt relentlessly. Yeah. And so you think I think yeah. of ketone salts and and of, and. I wonder, firstly, this is probably useful for a fat adapted athlete just because they're topping up their, their salt, um, <laughs> so regardless of, of any potential benefit of ketones. But yeah, I think what I'm really interested in actually right now is with all the work going on on ketones in general is as the price comes down and it becomes available to the public, I'm really interested to see how that, how that moves just, just on, in everyone's data. Because I, I think of myself, right, and it's one of those things it's, it's the same with, with loads of supplements, right? Where the hype comes, everyone starts taking it, and then the researchers are kind of desperately trying to catch up. And I fall into the same yeah. trap. And like, if, if ketones were affordable right now for me, I, I think I'd take them just because of, you know, why not? I'm, it's like, I, I see all these potential yeah. mechanisms, I'm like, there's no harm in that. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, ketones right now are still super expensive. I know, I think, as far I think there's a, HVMN have got a new one coming out as far as I've, I've seen a few things. I, I'm not sure exactly when it's coming out, but I think they've managed to reduce the price a bit um, to probably mi- mimic that of ketone salts actually off the top of my head. I think they've reduced the price by about three times, um, oh, which, wow. which I think, will, yeah, it's going to be a, a bit of a game changer there. But regarding the differences, I know I've, I've listened to the likes of Brianna Stubbs talk about ketone salts and, um, and a lot of it, honestly, is it's the stuff that I, I struggle with, the, the <laughs> The is it R, the R and the L forms and that that stuff I, I, yeah, I, I yeah. find that difficult. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah. I mean, looking solely from a, a how they impact ketones, I know that um, again, working rodents. I actually know it was human research that showed they looked at ketone Oxford University again. They looked at the rates of ketone use, determined and compared it to how much they increase ketones. Once you go past about two millimoles, you're not seeing a concomitant increase in ketone use. So. The yeah. takeaway being you don't need to go higher. So with ketones, especially with the doses that people are using at the start and just how how much increases ketones and so how quickly, it kind of seemed mm. like a slight overkill where you don't need your ketones to get that high. It's got no added benefit. So then I think about ketone salts, which never increased ketones as much, which was kind of a, a, a bad thing that people kind of saw as, but maybe it isn't as bad as we thought because, I mean, depending on how much you take, I think you can probably increase your ketones what, by one-ish for a serving, one, 1. 1.5 maybe. Which, yeah, yeah. Which is probably not far off, you know, 
we, we, we're too far from saying what is an optimal amount as such, but it's probably yeah. not far from what you need if, if you don't need to be above two millimol. So it's interesting. That, yeah, I found that. So as I say, we, we use ketones in our research, but but the, the best thing for me about them is is more than anything that you don't have that confounding variable of the other things you have in the salts more than anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's interesting because I've often because I've I've got um, prove it at mm. home. I like you. I got very excited and I thought, yeah, I'll buy all this prove it and I'll sell it to lots of people. But I'm very terrible at actually selling anything. <laughs> like I'm not like like I, I failed so like in my head I'm like, yeah, I could make a really good go of this. I don't know how people do it to be honest. Like I see people who sell prove it, they drive Teslas, mm. and I'm like, mate, you are doing way better than I could ever do. Um, but so, but I use them myself. Mm. And, um, and I definitely notice a difference to how I feel with regards to how, how fast I can run, mm. but also how alert that I feel. But I've also thought, yeah, there's 900 milligrams of sodium in this. So that's got to be something to do with it. Having said that though, I also, if I'm not taking ketones, I'll use, I'll use uh, like an element oh. supplement if you yeah, want. Yeah, I have to make Yeah. That. Yeah, so that's got a thousand milligrams of sodium, and there is a difference between how I sort of feel in them. So, I'd be yeah, I'd be really interested to see research that looked at you know just the use of the ketone salts and 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 performance and yeah, even though there's nothing to support how I use them, I I think that's where your research is going to be super interesting, just because you might talk to someone who says yeah, I'm the same, you know I get a real benefit from taking this small amount of sort of ketone supplements. Yeah, and um, what I find actually quite interesting with the whole, uh, with people talking about basically how they feel on keto, but also supplements work as well, but in keto with the, the exposure to ketosis, is that because I'm a, I'm a small scientist, I'm like when I'm talking to people, I'm like, this is out my arena, but I, this is really interesting, is when people describe just that kind of lucidity and how, how good they feel. And I look at that and mm. I'm like... Oh, I, w- I wish someone could study that so I can read read what they have to say because because it's it's outside my area. But I'm like, th- this is I mean, especially how consistently it comes up. And you have I, I want and the beauty of things like having ketones as a supplement. This is to me the most exciting thing about ketone supplementation from a research perspective is disentangling the effect of ketones specifically. And so because yeah. I hear so often from people on keto diets, they say, oh, I just feel great when I'm in ketosis and kind of general things like that. And it's hard to, mm. and for me, I'm like, this is really interesting, but you know, there are lots of things that come into my head as a scientist. I'm like, okay, you know, is this a placebo effect? Is this the reduction in carbohydrate? Is this the, the impact on glycemia? Is this, and there's, there's a million mm. things it could be. Whereas when you give them a ketone supplement versus a placebo supplement, okay, we can see actually, is it the ketones itself that are actually having an effect if there is an effect there? So that's why I'm really excited personally about ketones and especially because it's such, so, it, it's such a, a new area of research and it's like it, it's developing just so so quickly as the supplements yeah. now get cheaper and cheaper i think it's just going to explode especially when it comes to you know the take up by the public which i think i'm really interested to see yeah matt why are people who you're talking to why are they adopting a keto approach and what kind, type of athletes are you talking to like you mentioned that you've sort of come down to the sort of normal endurance sort of space now um who are the athletes that are doing um a ketogenic diet what are some of the themes that you're finding if any there are really two main ones because i mean with the interviews i'm doing i've spoken to people up to ultra endurance you know athletes but also people that are running you know 10ks or or sort of just racing their bike at the weekend over sort of unremarkable distances. And it's really, the, there are two main themes. You have the people that go in solely for endurance. And I think, to me, that trend is, is in ultra-endurance exercise, where people are actively choosing to restrict their carbohydrate because they believe that fat oxidation, and they rightly believe that there's a very important element of fat oxidation in, in the exercise they're doing. I think when you get down to the short ones, it becomes kind of a bit... Um, a bit more all over the place where people are kind of coming in from all sorts of reasons and one that comes up a lot is actually it's rarely for exercise performance itself when the distance comes down mm. and so it tends to be often well people have lost weight and now they're in good shape and now they they're exercising and now they want to start running um, and often other other people it's just a curiosity thing um, but what is interesting I heard was a lot of people go to it was almost like a last chance where like they found like okay like I just had nothing left to do, so I thought, you know, screw it, I'm going to try this. And that's kind of where they found, okay, something that actually kind of works for them as such. Um, so I think, yeah, as as the distance goes down, it becomes a lot less, well, a, a lot more varied. And and, t- and 
rarely is it, I think, a case of people dropping their carbohydrate for performance when you go below a kind of, well, below actually an ultra kind of distance, I think. Yeah. And what are you seeing anything with protein intakes or, you know, like are, are people following a generally very, uh, a more classical ketogenic approach or is it more of that sort of modified, um, I'm going to say real life keto approach, but I'm just interested to, <laughs> yeah, to hear what it, it's doing. definitely, definitely the latter. I, I've, I've especially, at least in, in the exercise space, I don't see, actually I've not come across anyone that's doing the, the real sort of pounding fat, keeping protein super low. Um, which to me actually was kind of reassuring as a sports scientist and, you know, we do a lot of, lot of work into protein and things like that and, and benefits in all sorts of areas. And I kind of, I do worry when I see the kind of things online about people trying to lower their protein intake specifically for ketosis, et cetera. And I still, outside of exercise, I, you know, I'm not an expert outside of exercise, but I, I worry about that still as a kind of general theme for people doing keto in the sort of, in the, real world i'm going to say as well in, in the real world because because if, there's some some of the things you, you read online about keto are, are just a, a bit all over the place with you know you've, you've got to keep your protein low um but the the in endurance at least to me very few people do keto and aim and there's very rarely like a, a an expectation of i'm trying to hit these kind of macros it's a kind of mm. it's more a focus on certain food groups and and there's never a an active restriction of protein, which is, which is encouraging because I think especially even in endurance, for a while there was kind of, I think protein was kind of dismissed for endurance athletes, but now more and more we're realising how important protein actually is for specifically for endurance athletes, um, which may again, yeah. I mean, and I look at that, I think, is that, as per my scientist, I'm like, is this confounding all these sort of individual cases where actually they've, they've accidentally massively up their protein and actually that's probably done them the world of good. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good point. Absolutely, because when you remove one, not remove an entire food group, but the overt mm. kind of food group, like all the really obvious carbs, you sort of have to eat something. Yeah, completely. And I suppose so. It's easy enough to um, lift protein if that's if that's the sort of case. Like, where do you think it's much? Like, if you're looking at sort of the the literature, at the people you're talking to, and then your research, which I want to just have a chat about as well. Where do you see uh, a ketogenic approach maybe being most beneficial like do you have an opinion on that or are you yeah what are your thoughts yeah i think there are a few areas where i'm interested in i think so i mean i'm studying particularly endurance exercise and within endurance exercise i think it's fairly clear that the longer the exercise gets the more rationale there is at least for keto but just with my like sports science hat on i think there are quite a few situations when i'm just sort of sitting back as like a sports fan and and i sort of just think to myself i wonder like where can I fit in keto? And there's a few that kind of pop up to me. One particularly is in weight making sports, so particularly combat sports, mm. where I see, especially when I mean, some of the research on weight making in like um, MMA and boxing and all these types of things, like it, it almost worries me how just how incredibly unhealthy it is. And you see people, you know, having to dehydrate themselves and having to restrict their calories. And I really wonder in these kind of sports, especially because when you're going through a, a phase, you're going through a camp and you've got a fight coming up and you're having to go through your hardest training sessions whilst restricting calories as much as you can i very Mm. much i would hypothesize there that being keto adapted may well be be an advantage because of well when you speak to keto adapted endurance athletes and they talk about how they can exercise faster and they that i mean one thing that comes up every time I speak to any cyclist, any time I see any cyclist, it's I can go six hours without without eating now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but I think that does have relevance for, for someone that's trying to maintain their actual their exercise output in in something like, you know, in an energy restricted environment. I'd be very interested mm. to see how a keto diet would stack up against like a standard, you know, diet that someone would be on in that kind of situation. I would hypothesize that having that increasing ketones and being keto adapted and being better able to use your fat would it would enable you to maintain a higher training output throughout that kind of phase of weight loss and hopefully mm. possibly even lose lose weight more effectively um without like a subsequent just rise in hunger that that must be difficult and hopefully then reduce the need for the sort of extreme weight making at the very end which which plagues yeah, those yeah. kind of sorts so that's something i'm really interested in outside of that and outside of ultra endurance i think where I see the future is I don't think there's ever going to be like a, for this sport, you have to be fat adapted type thing. It's never going to be that sort of cut and dry. So what I think is, is likely is that if you find particular use cases for it within sport, 
then there's a chance that certain individuals will benefit. I think of like off seasons or individuals that exercise a lot but are still, you know, struggling to make certain weights in team sports, for example. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, being here in, in the UK, I think of football being our main sport. I think of footballers that are training two, three times a day but are still, you know, not at the body fat percentage their coaches would want. It's not because they're yeah. it's not because they're exercising too much, uh, not like insufficiently. So then I think of things like, you know, is like an off-season period being keto something that could that could work there? I know there's um, re- research in Italy recently published a study looking at semi-professional footballers in Italy, which mm. I think is a really interesting area. I know there's, there's an American uh, sports scientist who was working, I forget which team he was working for, but he gave a really interesting talk on basically a, he, he got most of his team low carb for a, for a season. He has all their GPS data and things like that. Because the worry would be, you know, can they maintain their high intensity running output, et cetera? And he found that actually they were doing just as well. So I'd be quite interested in the use of things like low carbohydrate diets on like an individual basis in those kind of team sports. It's never going to get taken up by a whole team. I guess the problem you have yeah. there, and the problem actually in elite sport in general is that it's such a carb dominated environment that it's very hard. To, mm. it, it's very hard without buying from you know your well, from everyone around you to actually to actually maintain that. But I think. It's mainly going to be a case of specific use cases around, you know, uh, excess body weight. I think potentially weight making. I think I'm. Re- I, I would love to to see a study done on on weight making in in combat sports, and then an endurance yeah. outside of ultra endurance type things. I think it's it's probably a similar case because um, yeah. unless you if you've not got a problem to solve, then then you've not got a problem to solve. Then then there's no 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 real need, is there? I guess it's it's one of those. Yeah. It's, it's like specific use cases. Yeah, no, that's such a good point because um, I heard you say on another podcast and I agreed with you at the time that, you know, unless you've got a, um, you know, unless there's a reason to try something new, why would you bother? Mm. Like if things are working for you, then then why not just sort of stick with what you've got? And, you know, a lot of the um, argument for a lower carb approach, particularly in that endurance space, is that um, recovery space and the change in fuel utilization could potentially help with recovery. What's going on there, Matt? Great question. I don't know. It's a simple answer. I've, one of I've, <laughs> it, it's, it's another one that, firstly, at least when I interview people, it comes up all the time. It's recovery, and, and mm. I know, but there's so little literature on this one. I know there's a 2014 paper that's the only one that comes up to me. It's a Zajac paper where they looked, I think, post exercise information. Um, and it's the only one that I can remember that that really has looked into it. And actually, we've got a, a a poor PhD student here at Kingston who's who started looking at keto diets, exactly uh, looking at recovery. Um, and it, so I was really excited to see what he he was going to find. He started about a year after me, um, but he was doing it part time, and he's based in Qatar, so he's not been able to travel down very much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so there will be work from Kingston going on in that area, but it's just. <laughs> It's been slightly done. It's going to be years down the line. I'm so surprised that there's only one paper just because um, it's something you hear all of the time. And I just, and maybe what what I'm hearing is coming sort of from people who are doing it rather than because it's quite clear in the literature. Like I thought, oh, ketones are signaling molecules in the anti inflammatory pathways. There's so much rationale for it. Yeah. There's so much rationale for it. Yeah. and and this is where again people cite it so many times. I, there's one person I spoke to. I remember that um, I, I asked him, "When did you feel like you were keto adapted?" And they said they looked at their Strava at the end of a month and realised they'd done four times as many miles on the bike as they'd ever done before. <laughs> <laughs> um, which kind of adds to that. Like, so it comes up all the time, and you do have this kind of fairly clear rationale with the role of ketones and and inflammation. Um, so mm. I, th- and I think there will be work, and um, it's an interesting area. But yeah, it's. It's one that I passed on to yeah my, my colleague Rich, who unfortunately is, is stuck in Qatar. Yeah. And um, Matt, what kind of supplements and stuff are you finding people are um, utilising as part of their keto approach? Any surprises or just the standard? And I say the standard like everyone's going to know what that yeah, is. Yeah, it's but. a really interesting one because I, what I find with supplements, I, I'm like a do as I say, not as I do, because I, I love experimenting with things, right? but I very rarely recommend anything. But one thing that comes up, I say a weird amount, maybe it's collagen. But a lot of people take collagen. I don't know if, mm. if it's because people that have decided to go into a keto diet, maybe by nature more like health conscious or read into supplements more. I don't know. Um, but collagen comes up quite a lot, which I, which I'm interested in. And then I mean, you have I see like electrolytes come up a lot. So I know like things like magnesium. I think it's quite common. Um, mm. And I mean, a lot of people are very interested in ketone supplements because of 
they're reading into the potential role of ketones, which I think is fairly mm. probably not too uh, surprising. Um, I think of other ones. I'm I'm not. I don't. There's nothing really that that's, that that jumps out my head. Springs to mind. Mm. Yeah. Um, anything around hydration and keto adapted athletes, because, you know, we're, you know, uh, we had a chat about sodium and how important it is because we're unable to hold on to as many electrolytes mm. now. And, and are, the, are you finding any sort of different hydration practices or same old? I say same old, like, every, like you would necessarily yeah. know, but yeah. There's, there? there's nothing that, that's, that's popped out to me there, to be completely honest. I think the yeah. vast majority yeah. of people outside of elite athletes tend to follow a fairly standard hydration strategy of just drinking to thirst. I know it's, if people know their sweat rates and stuff, you can, you can kind of personalize it. I've not come across any necessary, any differences with keto adapted athletes. Whether there would be, actually, yeah. I, I don't know, to be honest. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and Matt, talk to me about your actual intervention study. What are you actually well, doing? My main study right now is um, it's a supplement-based study looking at essentially carbohydrate provision in keto-adapted individuals. And so what we're looking yeah. at is the effect of carbohydrates in general on metabolism and performance. And we're looking at it in kind of a few different ways. So the way we're doing it is they'll either take carbohydrate for two days prior to it. So the, um, the test we're doing is a 60-minute steady-state cycle followed by a 16-kilometer time trial. So that, that's mm-hmm. on the walk bike. It's around, you know, half an hour or so. So it's because there's been so little research on carbohydrate use in keto adapted athletes, really essentially none. Bits here and there, mm-hmm. especially in the sort of early 2000s, you had the sort of five days low carb add carbohydrate in, which, which obviously is, is very different. So we wanted to basically create the conditions of, okay, if carbohydrate is going to help a fat adapted athlete, it's going to be in a high intensity aerobic exercise event. And it's going to be after they've done some exercise, it's going to deplete their carbohydrate stores even more. They're already limited carbohydrate stores. That's kind of what, we, what we've done. And they're even taking carbohydrate, yeah, for two days before and also on the day of, so immediately before or just mm-hmm. before or basically any way around in that same a protocol so we have two days before and not on the day two days before and on the day just on the day and then not at all i guess for me the first at the start we're very because again as as a without having you know the funds to run you know loads of bloods and stuff we really we want to hyper focus on performance but on top of that i think yeah. what i'm really interested in with the carbohydrate addition is just those changes in metabolism through different carbohydrate provisions because i think Originally, when I started this, it was interesting when I was trying to recruit for adaptive people, and some of them were slightly concerned about, oh, if you give me carbohydrates, you know, I won't be able to burn any fat. Um, I'm seeing that less now. I think it's becoming more and more clear that, you know, taking carbohydrate isn't going to, you know, diminish any kind of fat adaptations. We know that fat adapted athletes will still burn a lot of fat if you give them carbohydrate. Um, mm. But what I'm interested in now is, is, is whether there are these subtle differences in metabolism through different pre exercise carbohydrate fueling. And then whether that obviously yeah. that has an impact on performance is really interesting. So that's the main one. We've yeah. got a few going on. So I have a, a similar study going on with ketone esters. With um, yeah. we're looking at ketone ester plus or minus carbohydrate in actually non keto adapted athletes. This one, um, we added that one in actually because there was a, a fairly recent paper looking at bicarbonate combined with ketone esters, and so and so yes. we're, we're we're trying to add add to that. And originally we were looking at getting fat adapted fat adapted athletes in for that, but um, I think we we realised that. Fat adapted athletes are few and far between. <laughs> so it's hard enough to get them in for one study, right? Um, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Them. Um, but we did start a remote based study to, to do that, to look at ketonesses on fat adapted athletes. Um, we did mm. this actually over, over the lockdown, we started it, where we were getting athletes on using a Zwift, the cycling app, and taking either. So we we're sending them either a carbohydrate drink, a ketonesser drink, or a combination. And obviously, you can't still, you can't get the same metabolic data. But what you can do is control a surprising amount. I think even you know, being it being a remote study, um, just to look at is there any obvious change in performance? And you can still at least through things like Zwift, you've got actually it makes a really nicely like ecologically valid study in the sense that often in the lab we have you know just a straight flat out time trial where you you know on a watt bike for us we use. Whereas if you go on Zwift, you've actually you've got these hills that you can look at in there. So we chose a route specifically that had like a nice little climb in there because I'm then interested in, yeah. you know, what you hear a lot from endurance athletes is, you know, they lose their top end speed, et cetera. So I'm like, okay, we can kind of look at that by, by putting them on Zwift yeah. and, and giving yeah. them a climb. So, so we're doing that as well. And um, so we've kind of got a combination of work with ketonesters on fat adapted athletes and non-fat adapted athletes and then, and then carbohydrate use in fat adapted athletes. 
And then on top of that, we're interviewing these fat adapt athletes as well, just to gain their experiences on keto diets in general and also their experience of keto adaptation. Because like I said, I think we, we know f- far less than we'd like to know about keto adaptation. Yeah, I, and I love that, Matt, because one, I'm just thinking it's so, it is much more sort of real world, particularly that sort of swift thing, because not only are they, you know, able to change the course, but you're around other people as well. Like, you know, like, like it's quite a different scenario from being in the lab. Mm. And the other thing I really love is that the, the you're testing what I'm seeing all the time in terms of when I'm chatting to people about uh, what they do with their diet pre-event and how to sort of um, quote unquote carb load mm. for someone who is uh, potentially a lower carb athlete you know to what level do they need to think about carbohydrate before their race and a lot of the people which I talk to are doing exactly what you described like we have an addition of carbohydrate um, the two days before and then on the day or um, for, for the most part, but I'm be really interested to see sort of what the difference is to just sort of carbo load and then not, mm-hmm. um, not when well, I say carbo load, but add carbohydrate yeah. and then not have anything on the morning. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting what, what I see as well as like a carbohydrate load now, because I, and I actually had to stop using that terminology because I was calling it myself, I was calling it a carb load and then I was looking at the carb numbers and I was like, to most people, this is still low carb <laughs> i'm gonna I feel like the terminology <laughs> yeah. needs, needs changing because i fall into the same trap um but it is interesting yeah. also then speaking to because uh, at the start it was kind of almost a because i mean what i love about the study for me is that i have i've got i'm guaranteed interesting data no matter what i find because the problem with research is obviously there's yeah. always there's always that worry that you know if you don't find anything statistically significant well no one's going to care about your research and then it leads to the kind of worries yeah. this the problem you see in supplement studies where there's this big publication bias where if something's positive it's got much more chance of going out for me seeing mm. no effect for me is just as interesting as seeing an effect if i because when i first started it i think actually over the last few years i've been doing this i've almost become i think i've, I've been going becoming more and more almost like moderate whereas at the start i was sort of a big like yeah keto yeah, yeah. whereas now i'm sort of coming into like a middle i'm like okay there's there's context here so at the start i was like I, yeah. I'm, I'm still actually i'm almost I'm getting less and less sure about the potential benefits of the carbohydrate simply because the more people I talk to, I hear so many people raving about how good they feel fasted. I'm like, I wonder actually how much yeah. carbohydrates do have. And then it comes down yeah. to, you know, for someone, especially in someone's diet, you can look at, because then this is why I, if I had all the money in the world and there was thousands of other people doing it, so there's so many different areas you can look at because no matter what I find, my next question straight away is, well, I wonder if there's an effect of slowly re-implementing carbohydrate, almost like a strategic carbohydrate placement just in someone's diet day to day, just to keep up that like mm. element of carbohydrate metabolism versus someone, like mm. you say, if someone's staying at 20 grams a day and really strict and doing all their exercise, then to me, I'm like, okay, yeah. they may well struggle with that carbohydrate metabolism if you've not given them any. And that's kind of why we actually added the, originally, that's why we added the two days in. I was thinking, okay, this is a way yeah. of just making sure they're slightly, their carbohydrate based enzymes are slightly increased if they're already quite low. And then that's, and yeah. also you have then the added potential benefit of just having those slightly high glycogen stores. Um, yeah. But it's already, I'm already annoyed by it, right? Because I'm like, I'm already speculating. Like, we can't, because we can't guarantee mechanisms. And the more work that comes out with carbohydrate, I'm like, there are, there are so many reasons any of this could be, no matter what I find, I'm already tearing my hair out. Yeah. Especially now, I don't know if you've come across the carbohydrate mouth rinse based research. Yeah. Oh no, I love it! It's brilliant. Right. I use it all the time with my athletes. So I'm like number one. I want to see this in keto adapted athletes, right? Because <laughs> yeah, right, that's yeah. And then number two, then if if carbohydrates are benefiting performance, I'm like how much of that is actually physiological? How much of that is because of glycogen change in the muscle? And how much of that is just because of that effect on the brain? Like, yeah, I, it's uh, there are so many different things that you could research, yeah. right? So it's so difficult to. Um, uh, I mean, basically, you've got a great career. In front of my, my supervisor hates me because he gets, he gets emails from me all the time where I'm like, do you reckon we can do this? <laughs> yeah, he's like, stay focused on yeah. the task, man. Hey, um, can you share any of your research yet? Are you at the point where you're able to sort of tell us a little bit about what you've found or are you still um, sort of in the uh, implementation phase? Yeah, we're it? very much doing the data collection phase of, it's actually an interesting one for me because, um, because of, you know, our labs were closed for just over a year, so we kind of had nothing going on. So it's, now they've reopened i'm kind of just doing all my studies at once rather than going one at a time so at some point there's going to be like a big dump of studies that we've got we've got but right now other than the case studies that i did um a few years ago 
we had the results we never published, but I, I find I find them interesting to talk about, right? Because really, what we had was we had our an ultra endurance athlete run. He's a he's run up to hundred miles. We had him do sixty and sixty seven kilometer runs, and we got him fat adapted. And in in that, really, the most obviously you have limited takeaways from a case study. What we did see was the big takeaways for me, at least, were this really quick shift to fat fat oxidation within a week. Mm. Um, and but interestingly we got him back on carbohydrate for six weeks after his keto phase and actually his best performance was going back on the carbohydrate after six weeks and this is actually what inspired a kind of the two day load to a point even though it's two days and six weeks are very different but we saw after six weeks he was still burning much more fat at that point than he was at the very start of the study and so Mm. this is where i kind of started to think i wonder if there's a a place in in a multitude of sports really for this kind of like a strategic six to eight weeks of keto or low carb to really just increase that fat oxidation in like an off season for example before going back to a standard diet and so to me that was really interesting just that we can increase fat oxidation and it doesn't just go like that especially when if you speak to like a keto adapted athlete that's kind of scared of carbohydrate i can say look i had this guy eat carbs for six weeks and he was still burning a lot of fat right and obviously not as much as when he was yeah. strict keto but but still there's it was almost like a it was in the middle of where it was at the baseline versus keto, which I think was interesting. But yeah, my, my current PhD research, we haven't got, well, we're basically right in the middle of everything. <laughs> it's, a, it's a busy time yeah. at the moment. So it's, um, it's I, I can only imagine what that is like. And it's interesting with your sort of case study, when I'm thinking about Burke's lab, how I believe that they they put a carbohydrate meal in for sort of keto adapt for uh, athletes who had done low carb and and. They, I think they called them keto adapted, but it might have been like quite a short sort of space of time. And they saw no real performance benefit from sort of the addition of carb. But I always think with these studies that are so well controlled, um, they've got such a limited time with which they actually run them. Mm-hmm. Like, I think time is the thing that's missing from them. Like, time to have the athletes do a low carbohydrate approach and then um, to get really, you know, to get better fat adapted like is that going to make a difference because I yeah you just get so confused by so much of the null um sort of research that that comes out I think yeah and I guess that and that's why I when I was discussing with supervisor who we're going to test I was like let's test people that are just already fat adapted and let's have that and let's make sure there's no one that can come at this study and say they weren't fat adapted So we were like, yeah, yeah. How yeah. long? Like, how, how long can we get away with and still have anyone come in? We're like, one year, two years? And we ended up with six months. I think with six months is, I think, a, a fairly reasonable number. Like, I, I, fingers crossed, no one's going to come out and say that they didn't have long enough on, on keto. Because I think you do always, you always hear that. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and Matt, this may, like, I have no idea whether you are, um, you know anything about this, but I will just throw it out there. Um, there is also research looking at the impact of a low carbohydrate approach on. Uh, bone turnover and um, that sort of low carbohydrate um, space there and also immune function and things like that do you have any thoughts on some of that research that we're seeing like what what can we and if you do you know what can we glean from that research if anything yeah I it's one that I think because I think there's a lot of research out of the the AIS group the race walking group they've done loads of Mm. I mean, the detail they can go into is just immense. I, I read those studies with absolute yeah. awe. I think they're they're definitely interesting. They've definitely got a there's definitely application there for concern for like short term periods. I think I think we have to be careful applying that to long term for adaptation. But I think there's definitely a place for especially with periods of intense training, you often see this decrease in immune function. So I think there's if someone's to say I want to go through like an intense training phase. I think I could I would use that research and say well actually I would have probably said the same before that research came out but I would have yeah, said yeah, maybe yeah. don't go keto now um I think but yeah. I think also just outside of keto it has that application for people on standard diets where they're trying to do things like carbohydrate restricted training where if their carbohydrate yeah. looks I know I think there was a, one of the recent ones that came out was looking specifically at um low energy availability versus like carbohydrate restriction over a short term yes. um, and so I do think it's it's important to note those kind of short-term changes but it kind of makes me even more interested in in what happens between that and then the kind of weeks after um which again yeah. is another is a is the question we can't answer i'd love to have like a study over six months we just get someone into a lab every week and just and take their blood and to see what's changing and, yeah. and and when these things if and when these things normalize because i mean yeah. if if this is an effect that that stands the test of time and after two years is still there then that's kind of a red flag um it seems yeah. very unlikely to me that that would be the case with a number of keto adapted people that you have and no no obvious sort of signs of that within the longer term research. 
Yeah, I think that's that's such an interesting point, actually, the, that we don't know what sort of goes on after that acute phase yet. And that's just difficult research to mm. do as well. Um, and I agree with you, like if someone is going into this intense training phase, it's unlikely that anyone would suggest, oh, yeah, now's the time to go strict mm. keto for, you know, for any sort of um, reason. Matt, just to finish off, um, because you've been super generous with your time, and I know that we're um, we're sort of probably over the time with which you had. Are you low carb? Like, what's your what's your sort of practice? What have, what are your takeaways that you might implement now that might have been different? Yeah, it's interesting. I think, and actually, what I've found interesting is speaking to uh, endurance athletes that are low carb and kind of comparing my experience to them. Because when I first started studying it, I got kind of obsessed with it and was like, because I wanted to try it out of curiosity. <laughs> and then it's almost like a oh yeah. wow, like it's like you can kind of I feel like I'm you know look at all you you people out there eating carbs I'm 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 going off on you know having <laughs> I'm not I'm not eating breakfast um, and so it kind of stuff like that and I and I kind of as as time went on I kind of became just more kind of less safe air with it and so now my kind of rule so my background is um when I was at university I was rowing just club rowing yes. and it's really interesting to come to look at the role of keto because it's just about the most high intensity aerobic sport you can you can take part in it's it's horrible <laughs> i don't know why i did it but <laughs> me then as a, a non-elite athlete i was like okay like how like how much can i play around with it? so because in my third year was when i was doing probably most of my rowing it's also when i was getting most sort of into keto and um yeah. and it was interesting looking back at it more so actually than the most i was doing because my carbs were really low and i was I was I was pulling quite nice scores and actually scores that I never I've never got back there since. And huh. so it's kind of intrigued me because I'm like, why not? I, I, I'm trained just as I was then. But anyway, long yeah. story short, I um I was performing just fine actually then with probably the lowest carbs, you know, pretty much fully keto other than you know, maybe the odd day here and there. Um yeah. now if I was to have been eating more carbohydrate then would I have been better? Quite possibly, obviously, I don't know. But now I kind of take a fairly relaxed approach where I'm, I'm pretty much in my own time, I, I keep my carbs low. And when I'm yeah. with friends or when someone's cooking me a meal, I'm eating whatever. I kind of take it like that because, well, because I can. And, and what I do yeah. is yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm moving. I, I, I have no necessary, you know, I have no health conditions that mean that I have to necessarily be concerned with carbohydrates. So I think I went through a phase personally where I was actively trying to avoid them. And I don't think I'll do that again just because there's a, there's a lack of need. And so for me as well, now yeah. I've come out of rowing, I've been trying to move slowly into like running around and as a with a kind of rower's body, running really is plodding. But what I like to do is <laughs> well, I, I, it's quite easy if you are going to eat carbohydrate to kind of use that to your advantage. And this is actually what comes up a lot with ultra endurance athletes is they're not scared of carbohydrate. They kind of use those occasions of, you know, I'm going to, you know, uh, my fat, my parents' house, and they're cooking me dinner. To okay, I'm going to go for a really long run the next day, and kind of use it as almost yeah. like a. It's like nutrition is periodized around the kind of things life throws at you, which is kind of the way I try and see it. Yeah, which is sort of how it should be, right? Yeah, but so it, it, it's kind of that nice balance, I think, between like not feeling bad for you know enjoying food, but also actually using almost your yeah. advantage in the exercise setting of right. Like I'm, I'm naturally wanting to increase my carbs around training slightly if I'm doing longer pieces or I'm doing harder pieces. So rather than doing that myself, I'm going to, you know, just let, let those things that would maybe two years ago have really kind of annoyed me and I'd have been annoyed at myself because I've had some extra carbohydrate here, actually use that to my advantage yeah. and be like, okay, I'm going to really enjoy, you know, this meal and then I'm going to go out and have a really good run tomorrow. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I imagine living where you are, you must be a beer and curry man. <laughs> oh, it's a uh, we... nothing. No, <laughs> you don't like a curry in the pub. Fair enough. I am. Um, that's it's a joke we hear quite a lot. Um, being in, yeah, I know. My husband's from the UK. Yeah, it's, it's the first thing I did when yeah. I went to uni here. It's the first thing my da- my dad said to me. <laughs> um, no, no. Do you know what? Unfortunately, for the world of low carb, I think my two favorite meals are mac and cheese and a carbonara. I, I, I just love Italian food, and and I went through the phase of trying to make like low carb versions of those, and you just can't. Oh. I refuse to accept. Mate, it's disappointing, eh? <laughs> I tried to make a, like a courgette carbonara, 
honestly, I, without <laughs> exaggerating, it turned into a, a courgette omelette and it was, it was just not pretty. Aww. But it was. Oh, I'm so disappointed for you, Matt. I understand. We've been doing the same with like um, cinnamon scrolls, mm. but um, because you do get that fat head dough that has the oh, mozzarella and the cream cheese, and and I tried one. I'm like, no, this is actually because um, we're in lockdown right now oh, as well. No. We're sort of um, almost I don't know, twelve weeks or whatever, and uh, and really missing finding a great cinnamon scroll. And actually, the best cinnamon scroll is a complete um, big old carb number. <laughs> Uh, and it is just delicious. And so, um, you know, you just, you take your wins where you can, you just appreciate that, you know, life is balanced. Yeah. And I mean, as I always say to like, the, especially like ultra endurance friends, like eat or ultra endurance athletes in general, like if you, if anyone like doing like keto for weight loss saw what you ate, they would be so jealous because you can get away with quite a lot, <laughs> like, especially when, when you're exercising, you, you can, you can, I mean, <laughs> I remember when I first, when I first was just sort of trying it out myself and I was getting into it and researching it in my first couple of years I was really like I had my my keto monitor and I was really like I was interested in it but I was also like it's like how much can I actually get away with here and I was really playing around I remember going, we had like on our Sundays we used to do like quite hard rowing sessions and I was like right I want to know how much carbohydrate I can eat and be in ketosis the next day and so I, I tested my ketones like the Sunday morning it was you know 0.4 0.5 and then we had like a really hard, high intensity session, goes on quite long, so two, three hours, you know, two sessions. Ooh. And then I was like, right, I'm going to fast during the day and I'm going to eat the greasiest, biggest pizza I can get my hands on, right? And they're, they are just, oh, just not even that satisfying, to be honest, right? They're, they're, you feel awful after yeah. eating them. But I had it thinking, right, well, I wonder how long until I'm back in ketosis, blah, blah, blah. Next morning, my ketones were 1.1. And I was like, I, oh. <laughs> I was like, right, I... I can't tell anyone this because they're going to get the wrong idea. <laughs> but it's just interesting to show like how, just how much you can kind of, I say get away with, but I would never recommend someone have, a, it was, I'm talking like a 20 inch pizza. It was a, a big, big thing. Mate. But it kind of, kind of shows. I think you've just, just, you've just sort of described the whole, like, isn't that like a standard sort of diet for a university student really? <laughs> yeah. I did. But probably not with the, uh, not with that massive rowing. I just, yeah, add, add in some fat adaptations of high intensity exercise and you can, you can basically stay in ketosis and eat what you want. No, that's not the takeaway I want people to get. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. Now, um, can you tell people where we can find you if anyone's got any questions about, like, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm just throwing you under the bus, really. Like, so you, you'll get like this influx of emails. But yeah, where can people find out more information? Yeah, uh, so I guess the best place to get me is probably Twitter, um, which I think my handle is MattCarpenter14. Um, and if not, yeah. my email is m.carpenter at kingston.ac.uk. So if anyone wants to email me with any questions as well, that's that's absolutely fine. And if anyone wants to participate in any of my studies, we're always looking for people because fat adapter athletes are an absolute premium. Um, so yeah, that's that's great. But also, yeah, thanks for having me on. I, um, these things, I love talking about these things. We could talk about keto and, and exercise things forever. So those sorts of topics that just never get boring, really. So. I totally agree. You've been fabulous, Matt. Thank you so much. Awesome, yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. Alrighty. Hopefully you uh, got a lot out of that conversation. I know I really did. And as I said, all links to how to find Matt will be in the show notes. Next week on the podcast, I am stoked to have been able to chat to my good friend, Sarah Cowley-Ross, who is a real advocate for women in sport and um, as a former Olympian athlete herself, we talk all about her sort of athlete experience and that transition from athlete to mother and sport advocate. So that's a really great conversation, which we're bringing to you next week. Until then, team, you can catch me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition, on Instagram and Twitter at Mickey Willardin or over on my website, mickeywillardin.com, where you can sign up to one of my meal plans, the recipe access, or book a one-on-one consultation. Have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.